celebrated by history. Even though we know that every day is part of history as we live and breathe. As I stand in this place, which is a part of the history here in Raleigh, the first Cosmic Father of the Baptist Church, we thank you. We thank you for keeping the doors open, Lord. Thank you for keeping the lights open. Father, we come asking that you touch our sick and shut in. As I stand in the gap this morning, Father, we pray for those who don't know you in the part of their sins. We pray for those that are on the corner this morning, Lord, wondering which way to go. For we know that you are a mind fixer, a heart regulator, Lord. We pray for those that are sick and shut in this morning, Lord. Let them know that they are not alone, but you promise never to leave us alone. And Father, Again, we say thank you as we celebrate the love of Jesus, Lord. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who died upon the cross. And you know, on Friday, they thought it was all over. But early on Sunday morning, he got up. And since he got up, we have a right to the true life. And Father, for that, we thank you. 
As we come this morning, Lord, we ask you to bless this service. Touch our pastor, Lord. Let him down in your will. Fill him with your love. As he speaks your word, Lord, help us to be hearers and doers. In my son Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Scripture reading came from the 40th chapter of the Old Testament book of Isaiah. I'll be reading from that same chapter, but different verses. Our text is found in Isaiah 40 and verses 27 through 31. Listen to the words of the text. Isaiah writes, Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. Has thou not known, has thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and, the we and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Amen. I want to share with you today on the subject, growing stronger while waiting longer on the Lord. Growing stronger while waiting longer on the Lord. The book of Isaiah is a record of the prophetic preaching of Isaiah, a prophet 
sent by God to his chosen people of Judah, especially those from the city of Jerusalem. God speaks to Isaiah in a vision, and Isaiah transcribes the vision into a manuscript which we now know is that Old Testament book by his name. The prophet utilizes the majority of the book to condemn the people for their moral and spiritual downfall, for breaking their covenant with God, for not honoring or obeying God. He condemns the Hebrews for turning their backs on the Lord who chose them to be his people. God had blessed them abundantly for generations and they had severely damaged their fellowship with God. They had forgotten their history. Uh, they'd not valued their heritage. They dishonored their great and loving God. They had turned from abiding by the commandments of their holy God and were willfully living in sin. The day came when God judged them for their sins and sentenced them to hard times. They've been exiled from their homeland and they are now distressed for their city Jerusalem has been destroyed. They are hard, their hearts are broken and they are on the verge of giving up hope. Where is God, they ask. He was there when their ancestors cried in Egypt and he rescued them from slavery. He was there when they were trapped between Pharaoh's army and the Red Sea and he made a way of escape for them. So now they ask, where is God? God was there when they reached Canaan. He defeated their enemies and gave them the promised land. God had always been there for his people from generation to generation. But now their sins have borne dire consequences. They have reaped what they sowed and more. Six times in the book of Isaiah, God declared woes on his people. And now they ask, where is God? After years of exile and tragedy, God tells Isaiah to change his sermon from one of condemnation to one of comfort. Comfort my people, God says. Tell her, Isaiah, that her warfare has ended and her iniquity is pardoned. God has called them to repent, but they didn't. They aren't worthy of salvation, but God loves them. They don't deserve a second chance, but God gives them one. Yes, he has punished them. Yes, he's allowed them uh, to lose their homeland. But now the prophet says, God will forgive them. And in time, he will return them to their proper place. Isaiah preaches a message of hope for Judah. He prophesies of the coming Messiah, Jesus, the Lord of Lords, and the King of Kings is coming. The Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, Isaiah says, is coming. The Son of God, the Savior, the Kindred Redeemer is coming. At the end of chapter 40, there is a wonderful crescendo. In this much needed word of hope, there is a promise that God will strengthen his people, but not immediately. The promise is to be realized in days to come. Not now, but later. So Isaiah encourages the people to hold on. Better days are coming. How does one hold on when you've already held on for so long? How does one feel encouraged when life has been so discouraging? How does one 
sustain life and health and mental and emotional stability while in the midst of trials and tribulations? How do you keep going when your going is around in circles? The Hebrews heard Isaiah and they asked, where is God? When is the Messiah coming and, and what do we do in the meantime? They had no military might. They had no bargaining power. They were in no position to negotiate with their enemies nor their God. They were sinners, paying for their transgressions. Like a parent to a child, God had sent them to their room as punishment to consider their wrongdoings, to think about God's goodness and their sins. They had a long time out to think about what they'd done wrong. God would restore them, but both physically and spiritually, but at his time. But what were they to do until then? Where was their God, they asked. Why didn't God answer their prayers? Why hadn't he overthrown their enemies? Why hadn't he freed his people? What nerve they had to ask God's whereabouts, the God who they had disrespected. Where was God, they asked. The God they paid no attention to. They had traded him in for idol gods. They had changed their allegiance to man-made gods. They disregarded Jehovah's teachings and lived to satisfy their fleshly desires. They didn't call on God when they were worshiping idols. They didn't call on God when they were partying. They didn't call on God when they lived as drunkards. They didn't call for him then, but now they ask, where is God? What do you do when you don't have the strength to either escape or survive? What do you do when you're tired and weary? What do you do when you are frustrated and frazzled? What can you do when you have no options? When all you can do is sing those words of that hymn, I am weak and I need thy strength and power to help me over my weakest hour. The first thing that I recommend you do is to know that God will come. Well, that's what Judah needed to hear, that God will come to their rescue. There's nothing worse than praying and calling on God to come to your rescue and feeling after prayer that he's not coming. When you're physically, emotionally, and, and spiritually weak, when you're weary, worn, and sad, find in him a resting place and he will make you glad. Know that God will come. Isaiah said, Behold, the Lord shall come with a strong hand. When God comes, he will set things straight. When God comes, he'll put everything in order. When he comes, he'll fight your enemies for you. When he comes, he will make a way out of no way. When God comes and he's coming, good things will happen. Things will change for the better. God doesn't just come, but when he comes, everything will be all right. You might be alone now, but God is coming. You may be in trouble now. God is coming. You may be sick and suffering. Know that God is coming. There's something about the presence of God that is encouraging. That songwriter knew that when he wrote, I come to the garden alone, while the dew is still on the roses, 
And the voice I hear call falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. He speaks. And the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing. And the melody that he gave me within my heart is ringing. And he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me that I am his own. And the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. Oh, what peace and joy it brings to know that God will come. Secondly, know that God is strong and powerful. Isaiah said, when God comes, he'll come with a strong hand. When God comes, he'll come and his arm shall rule. He reminds us of God's power. Isaiah asks a rhetorical question, a question for, for these Judah people, the Hebrews, to consider as they look back at their sins. Think about God, he says, who measured the waters in the hollow of his head. God did. Who measured heaven with a span? God did. Who calculated the dust of the earth and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance? God did. No one is superior to, no one is equal to God. No one gives God directions. No one counsels our Lord. No one has ever taught God a lesson or taught him right from wrong. Who gave God knowledge and showed him understanding? God is so great and powerful. The nation of the worlds are less than nothing and worthless before him. Our God is mighty. He is omnipotent. He, he is omniscient. He is omnipresent. No matter how bad things get, find comfort in knowing that we serve a strong God. He's strong enough to protect you. He's powerful enough to heal you when you're sick. He's able to keep you safe no matter what dangers come. God is a strong God. He's got power to do miracles in your life. He's got power to fix whatever is broken in your life. We serve a strong and a powerful God. There is no limit to what God can do. And what he's done for others. He'll do the same for you. We ought to bring our cares to God, knowing that he will see us through them one and all. Do not worry about problems, concerns, situations, circumstances, because God is strong and powerful. Then thirdly, Isaiah told Judah, that they had to do something that nobody likes to do. Wait on the Lord. Nobody likes to wait. We go to fast food restaurants because we don't want to wait. And if you're like me, if the drive through line is long, we go inside to keep from waiting. Drivers on the street are impatient. They, they don't want to wait. When the light turns green, if you don't move immediately, horns start blowing. People run red lights in a hurry, going nowhere because they don't want to wait. Children don't want to wait in line at school, so they cut lunch line. Being impatient and not wanting to wait is a part of our nature. When babies are hungry, they, they don't want to wait for their bottle of milk, they cry out. 
to let you know they want it now. Adults are worse than babies. Our society is a now society. We want everything now. We want what we want and we want it now. We want our money now. I've seen signs that fast food establishments that are seeking employees read, work today, get paid tomorrow. We use credit cards because we don't have the money to make the purchase, but the credit card enables us not to wait, but get it now. Even good Christians may be impatient and might even be heard praying, Lord, give me patience. And give it to me now. Israel was tired of waiting. Now they were tired of being miserable every day. They were tired of waiting to return to their homeland. They'd been waiting, they thought, long enough. But Isaiah said they had to wait. Sometimes you and I have to wait. Wait until the Lord says it's time. Wait until God says you can go. Wait until the Lord says change jobs. Wait until the Lord says so. You want to quit, but God says wait. Wait for my timing. Wait until God prepares the way. Wait while God is fixing somebody's heart. Wait while God is going before you. Wait until your anger subsides. Be like Job and wait until your change comes. <clears throat> in John's Gospel, the writer tells of a family who in a time of death had to wait. You remember the story? There were two sisters and their brother, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Uh, they were close friends of Jesus. They lived in a small town near Jerusalem called Bethany. One day these sisters sent a message to Jesus. It said, the one whom you love, Lazarus, is sick. And they, of course, figured that when Jesus received the message, he immediately come to Bethany and heal his friend Lazarus. They didn't think twice about it. They knew that as much as Jesus loved Lazarus, he'd come as soon as he got the message. But John 11 and 6 tells us differently. It says, when he, Jesus, heard that Lazarus was sick, he waited, waited two days in the same place. In verse 11, Jesus says, our friend Lazarus is asleep. But I'm going to awake him. And three verses later, he says, Lazarus is dead. Jesus went to Bethany, but when he arrived, it was too late. He waited too long and missed the viewing. He waited too long and missed the funeral service. He went to Bethany, but by the time he'd arrived, Lazarus had been dead, buried, and was in the grave for four days. Have you ever been disappointed with God's timing? Have you ever been upset with God because he didn't come when you wanted him to come? When Jesus arrived, he was first met by Martha and a little later by Mary, and both of them met Jesus with a complaint. I can hear them talking to Jesus, almost pointing their finger in his face, saying, you waited too long. If you hadn't waited, Lazarus would still be alive. I don't know, they said, why you waited, but if you hadn't waited, Lazarus would not have died. I can't believe that you waited so long. Lazarus was your friend, Jesus. 
The two of you hung out together. You ate together. You talked with one another. You had a friendship and a bond. How, Jesus, could you wait so long? Why, Jesus, did you wait so long? Jesus went to the cemetery and there he said, Lazarus, come out of the grave. And after four days of being dead in the grave, Lazarus got up, brushed himself off, and, and lived a while longer. I heard Jesus say, I waited, but not too late. Not too long. I waited longer than you preferred, but not too long. I waited long enough to bring glory to God. I waited long enough to show the world God's power. I waited long enough so that you could see that I am more than a healer. I waited long enough to build up your faith and to give you a testimony. Sometimes God can do great things only after he makes us wait. I close today by telling you what Isaiah told you. I hope it encourages you. Isaiah asked the people a series of questions. Then he followed the questions with a wonderful truth. He said, have you not known? Have you not heard that the everlasting God the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching for his understanding. He giveth power to faint, and to them that have no might, he increases their strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Here's the best news for the day. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Isaiah didn't say, you might, or you may, or you'll have a better chance. He said, you shall renew your strength. You shall grow stronger. You shall grow through it. You shall overcome it. You shall climb above it. You shall be victorious. It is a promise from the Lord. You can count on it. You can bank on it if you wait on the Lord. He shall renew your strength. And when he does, you will mount up with wings like eagles. You will run and not be weary. You will walk and not faint. I read that and thought God moves in mysterious ways. One would normally think, at least I did, that, that when God strengthens you, you walk first, run second, and fly like an eagle last. That's normal progression. But God is not normal. He does things differently than we do. You remember the scripture says his thoughts are not like ours. When you see this from God's perspective, it makes perfectly good sense. When you are troubled, God first enables you to take flight and fly above your trouble. And after you wait on the Lord, God continues to strengthen you in the process and he enables you to move from flying over your troubles 
to running through your troubles. And finally, after moving more and waiting more, after praying more while you're waiting and while you're running because you meditated on the word of God while you were running and waiting because you served while you waited and you worshiped while you waited and you got stronger while you waited. Your faith increased while you waited and you stop running and you walk in faith. You can even walk like David through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil because God is with you. And like David, you can say, I will fear no evil. You can say, I am stronger because I wait. I am wiser because I waited. I am more confident than I have ever been because I waited. I, I'm still standing because I waited. I waited on the Lord and he renewed my strength. I am much stronger now than I would have been if God had not made me wait. God always knows what's best. And he knows that this, I want it now and I want to do it now, is not best for us. He enables us to do it when we have been prepared. When we have waited long enough until God says it's time. How often through your life have you waited on the Lord? And when he says it's time, you realize this is better than I imagined. Greater than I thought it would be. God has done more marvelous things than I ever thought he would. I am so glad that I waited on the Lord. Because when I did, he moved me from flying above my troubles to running through my troubles to walking in faith because God was walking with me, holding my hand. I knew that everything would be all right. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, our wise Father, he who is holy, he who is the creator of all things, as the scriptures have said, you have made all things and you are above all things and nothing compares to our God. We are so grateful today that you are not only powerful, but that you give us strength. And that you are not only strong, but you give us your love. That you care for us. We are so thankful for your compassion for us. That you've been gracious and merciful towards us. We pray to ask your blessings upon your children as they call upon you in prayer. We ask you to meet their needs. We have no doubt at all about your ability to do whatever it is that we need you to do. We just ask in the name of Jesus, our Savior, that you will come to our rescue. We know you to be a healer 
And we ask now that you will heal the sick. We know that you're a provider. Meet the needs of those who are without. You've comforted us so many times before. Comfort now those who are bereaved. Oh God, whatever it is that your children are crying out to you for, whatever it is that they're asking for guidance in, whatever directions they need, please meet their needs now in the name of Jesus. Give us strength to stand. Give us strength to walk. Give us the strength to be the church in this day, in this community, in this time, sharing the word of Jesus Christ, being the light for those who are in the dark, share, showing them the way to Jesus Christ. Please forgive us for our sins and help us to be holy. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord. Amen. Today is the day to give your heart to Jesus. All you have to do is have faith and trust. 